Chapter Twelve of Night of Malachi by Eva K. Betts. The two priests and the two brothers were busy. For the Carnwardy, a colorful person whose temperament had sometimes in the past brought him into conflict with his superiors, found the work on Malachi much to his taste. His career up to this time had been an active, generous, and sometimes stormy one. He had been a parish priest at Stavelot in France, where he had shown special devotion to the sick poor. Once, in 1866, when a dreadful epidemic scourged his impoverished parishioners, he had cared for them with no thought of his own rest or safety, giving them every consolation and comfort he could, up to and including his own bed. He had gone as a missioner to India, and then to the United States, where, for fifteen years, he had tramped through Oregon, preaching, teaching, and baptizing among the Indians. Blazing sun or cutting sleet had never held him back, nor was he deterred by hostility in his audience. The unfriendly Indians knew that this man rode unarmed, unafraid of the scalping knife. War paint and battle cries would never make him shudder. Other steps must be taken against him. One day they delegated a brave to wait on Father Conradi, with worry that the Indians planned to hang him. Father Conradi considered the message for a moment, then he gravely took out his watch. Here, he said, you must take this. The startled brave stepped hastily backward. What? What? Did you not understand what I said? He stammered. We plan to. You plan to hang me, the priest finished smoothly. Since you make such a kind offer, I must respond with a gift. Here, take it. Again he stepped forward, offering the watch. Again the confused Indian backed away. I must have time to consider this, he said, and left hurriedly for the Indian settlement. The elder chiefs of the tribe were called together in consultation, but even the most experienced among them had never before met such a situation. He offered his watch as a gift, one asked incredulously. The brave nodded. He understood what you said, that we planned to hang him, pressed the second. Just what did he say? demanded a third. He said, you planned to hang me. Since you make such a kind offer, I must respond with a gift. Those were his words. The old chiefs sat silently around the fire. There was something very strange, possibly dangerous, about this man who offered a good watch for the pleasure of being hanged. Such a mystery it might be well to leave alone. They thought a little longer. I think it will not be well to hang this man, said the first elder finally. Nor to shoot him with arrows or scalp him, added the second. This man we will leave alone, said the third, and all the others of the council agreed. So Father Conradi went unmolested about his mountain parish. It was so large that it took him three days of travel on horse and afoot to cross it. It was so poor that the priest used, as candle holders on the altar, potatoes which he later cooked and ate. In 1877, Father Conradi heard for the first time about Father Damien. At once, and at last, he knew where his calling was. Father Conradi was not a member of the congregation to whose care the leper colony had been given, but he placed himself under its jurisdiction. Even so, his going to the island was not understood nor approved by some members of the congregation. But though there was some conflict about this, which was bound to disturb Father Damien, there was joy and comfort too. He is a veteran missionary, wrote Damien of his new helper, who is clearly at home here. He has done me many a good turn in the two months that he, like a cheerful brother and a good companion, has spent at my side, leper though I am. In September of 1888, Damien developed a bad fever. He was confined to his room in the small house, which he had described as looking out on his lovely garden of the dead, the little cemetery he had dug and decorated almost by himself. Somewhat nearer the house, as if he still wanted to keep watch over them, the children were buried. Damien had been ill for six weeks when, in November, three nuns arrived at the settlement. Sister Mary Ann who had been so kind when he was at the hospital in Honolulu, was in charge of the group. All the nuns were eager to do what they could to ease good Father Damien in his final days. Shortly after the sisters' arrival, Father Wendelin Mullers was assigned to Molokai as pastor of the church at Kalapapa. Father Wendelin was a member of Father Damien's own mission congregation, and when Damien first heard the news, he feared that Wendelin was coming to replace him. The thought that he might be removed from his work had upset him very much. But a letter from the bishop made it clear 
that it was not a question of removing Damien as pastor at Kalawao, but of having a priest ready to take over when he could no longer discharge his duties. Both knew that day was not far off. So Father Damien's hopes were at last being fulfilled. The nuns for whom he had been begging so many years would be at the settlement to help with the nursing, to teach and guide the orphan girls. He had the two brothers and Father Conradi to assist him at Kalawao, and Father Wendelin in the church at Kalapapa. On the day of the nuns' arrival, Father Damien, although he had been in bed for six weeks, got up and went to the shore to meet them. He conducted them about the settlement, showing with pardonable pride all the improvements he had been able to introduce, describing with eagerness all that he felt was yet to be done. He pointed out the great pandanus tree under which he had lived when he first came to the island and under which he hoped to be buried. Finally, he brought the nuns to the orphanage and introduced them to the girls who would be their charges. He explained to the children that they were soon to leave the makeshift building which had sheltered them. It was the original girls' home he had built years ago. Now they would live in the fine new home at Kalapapa, built through the generosity of a Honolulu resident, Mr. Bishop. God will call me to spend Easter with him, said Damien to the children, but you will not be left alone. These good sisters will care for you. Sick and disabled though he was, Father Damien had not finished working. There was so much to be done, was still his cry. He moved about the island when he could, as best he could, always planning for his beloved lepers, always praying to God to help them. It delighted him that the sisters were on the island, that the girls were sheltered and cared for in the bishop home. He did not always understand the sisters' way of doing things, but he never interfered. Fierce as a tiger when fighting for the unfortunates, he loved so dearly. Impetuous, finding obedience hard when he received orders he felt not best for his flock. He was also gentle and deeply humble. One day he managed the painful journey to Kalapapa. Although the bishop home had been constructed without a chapel, the nuns had turned one of the ground floor rooms into a small oratory in which the Blessed Sacrament was kept. On this morning, Sister Leopoldina hurried to the little garden outside the building to dispose of flowers taken from the altar and to get fresh ones. The compost heap of garden refuse was at one side. As she ran at the corner of the building, the nun gave a startled cry. Kneeling on top of the compost was Father Damien, his eyes on the chapel window, adoring Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. He mistook her cry of surprise for one of disgust at his appearance. Sister, he cried, I expected no one to come out here. Please forgive me for putting myself, a leper, in your way. Sister Leopoldina was so moved that she could hardly answer. But sometimes, though he was in constant pain as his disease spread to deeper nerve centers, Father Damien forgot he was a leper. Here is a treat for you, he would say to Father Conradi, handing him a piece of fruit or a cake. You may eat it because no leper has touched it. Advent came again, the last time that Damien would see that holy season. The Gospels of Death and Judgment, which belonged to Advent, held special meaning for him. He never forgot that he was soon to be judged. His hands were now so badly decomposed that he could not celebrate Mass. He still read his bravery, however, though light was a real torture to his eyes, which the effort of reading greatly increased. The lepers still gathered around him in the evenings, eager to talk and to listen to him. If he had received a letter from home during the day, they expected him to read it aloud to them. The Kanakas felt that his family was their family, his friends their friends. Their first contact with the world outside their own part of the islands had been through his stories of Paris and Louvain and Tremelou. They knew that small town, its cobbled ways, its houses, and its people. And even though they now saw many more distant places through the projected pictures of the magic lantern, they still loved Damien's tales. The evening sessions grew shorter as the season moved on. Each day was precious, an occasion. January 3, 1889 was Damien's 49th birthday. By calendar, he was still a comparatively young man. In reality, he was old, feeble, much of his body already dead. Yet he was still driving on for the betterment of his children, planning and sometimes executing the plans himself. He had never had much in the way of worldly goods, but now he began to dispose of everything. His old horse went to his companions. 
he also made a will turning over to the bishop whatever possessions might still remain, with the understanding that they be used according to Damien's wishes. How happy I am, he said to Father Wendelin, to give up everything to die poor. He was forced by his illness to go to bed, but bed, as the other priests discovered, when they went to look after him, was a pallet on the floor of his room. The man who had received gifts from all over the world had given everything to his needy. He had no sheets, no change of linen, but lay with a single blanket wrapped around him as he shook with fever. The two priests and the brothers at once went out to get a bed for him. They brought it into the room and set it up. Come, Father Damien, said Father Conradi. Here is your bed. Let Brother Joseph and Brother James lift you into it. But I do not need a bed, Damien protested. I do very well where I am. Oh, Father, we want you to have it, urged Father Wendelin, and Mother Mary Ann has sent clean sheets and a blanket to make you comfortable. Comfort, said Damien. Give the sheets and blankets to some of those who really need them. When he saw that his friends were distressed, he agreed to use the bed and bedding, but it cannot be said that he rested much. His room quickly took on some of the aspects of a railroad terminal. The lepers were constantly in and out, calling on their camiano. The meerschaum pipe, which the bishop had sent him for Christmas, lay unused on the table in Damien's room. The one gift which meant much to him, these last days, was the painting of St. Francis of Assisi, with the wounds of Christ in his hands and feet and side. Both Francis and Damien were consumed by love of God and love of their fellow men. Both had been marked by God, one with the stigmata, one with leprosy. The first had left wealth and renounced the desire for knighthood to become a friar. The second had left the world to become a knight among the lepers. Though Damien could not say Mass, he was never separated from God. Each night at eleven, Brother James would come to his room, and together they would recite prayers in preparation for communion. At a quarter of twelve, Brother James would wake Father Conradi. Together they would go to the church for the Blessed Sacrament. Through the soft night, the stars looked down on the two men, one carrying the host, the other preceding him with a lantern. Past the trees under which Damien had started his life on Malachi, to the house in which his life was ending. Father Damien was peaceful these days. All the worries and anxieties had left him. I moved gently towards my grave, he said in a letter to his brother Pamphil. It is God's will, and I am very grateful to him that I am dying of the same disease and in the same way as my flock. I am very happy. I have my heart's desire. To Father Wendelin he repeated what he had told the children. Our Lord is calling me to keep Easter with him. Will you leave me your cloak, as the prophet Elias did to his successor, Elysius, so that I may inherit your great heart? asked Father Wendelin. I am no Elias, said Damien. Anyway, what would you do with it? You couldn't wear it. It's full of leprosy. It was Saturday, April 13th, that Damien received communion for the last time. He spoke of his devotion to the congregation, and after he and the others had said the community prayers, Damien exclaimed, How sweet it is to die a child of the Sacred Hearts. On April 15th, the Monday of Holy Week, Father Conradi sent word to Kalapapa that Father Damien was near his end. Father Wendland left as quickly as possible and hurried toward Kalawao. On the way, he met another messenger who gave the final word. Father Damien had died in the arms of Brother James, died like a tired child falling asleep. The brothers dressed him in his cassock, the uniform of service to the Sacred Hearts which he so loved. Quite soon, all signs of leprosy had disappeared. His face was clear and the sores on his hands were gone as if heaven were showing its approval of a beloved son. His body was carried to the church, where it lay that day and night, surrounded by lepers who prayed and wept. The next day his funeral followed the pattern he had established years before, the band, the societies, and uniform. Their loving, beloved Kamiano was dead. They laid him to rest under the great Pandanus tree. Father Damien was gone, but his impact on the world was far from ended. Indeed, it was never to be fully measured. A farm boy from Flanders, he had from early youth been fired by a love of God, whom he delighted to adore in the Blessed Sacrament. A powerful, vigorous young man, it seemed obvious to him that loving the Creator must be followed by loving his created. 
To Damien, to love was to give, so he gave his life. He would have been upset, or perhaps somewhat amused, at the adulation heaped on his memory. To him, life had been simply a matter of doing the job at hand, doing it to the best of his ability and with the materials available. He was grateful that heaven had chosen him to work with the lepers. With entire courage, with tender love, and with unswerving fidelity to duty, he had fulfilled his destiny. Because of his courage and love and fidelity, uncounted people were inspired and encouraged to face their daily problems. Hundreds of boys found their minds turned to God and became priests in his service. Girls became nuns doing his work. On a larger, less personal scale, the governments of various countries bestirred themselves to give better care, better food and housing, and medical treatment to the lepers under their jurisdiction. Organizations already formed for the aid of lepers took on new vigor. New ones sprang up. Years passed, but the love which Damien had inspired remained living and warm. The people of Belgium wanted his body returned to them. In 1936, at the request of Leopold III, King of the Belgians, and with the cooperation of President Roosevelt, Damien's body was disinterred. The lepers watched while the coffin was reverently placed aboard a white army Air Force plane. It seemed quite fitting to the islanders, who were so accustomed to symbolism, that if they must part with the body of the man who had done so much for them, it be carried out over the sea into the sky. At Honolulu, the United States Transport Republic received the coffin for the journey eastward across the Pacific. A Belgian ship was waiting at Panama to take Damien's remains to his homeland. They were received there with military honors. Dignitaries of religious and civil life were present at the solemn pontifical mass sung in the cathedral. Then, in the evening, the casket was placed in a hearse for the slow last journey. Across the Tremolu countryside he had loved, and left as a boy, it moved and to the chapel at Louvain. Joseph de Wooster was home again. The conviction that this man had been a true hero of holiness has not died down. On the contrary, it is steadily increased. In Rome, there has begun a long, slow, scrupulously careful process. This is the study of Damien's life and virtues, the study always made by the Church in the case of those who may one day be called saints. End of chapter 12. Recording by Maria Therese. End of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts.